The Labour leader faces a revolt among his top team with 12 departures in the wake of the EU referendum. In the last few minutes, Jeremy Corbyn has said he will stay in post despite members of his shadow cabinet saying they have no confidence he can win an election. Oh, he's a good and I mean, decent man, but he is not a leader, and that is the problem. After the vote, questions over how Britain will move forward in balancing future trade deals and migration numbers. Those who say, don't worry, uh, they'll allow us to have control of migration from the European Union while maintaining single uh, access to the single market, are simply mistaken. Tonight, as the Conservative Party looks to the future, both Theresa May and Boris Johnson are reported to be considering leadership bids. Also ahead, a roller coaster accident at a theme park near Glasgow. Eight children are among the injured. All I could see was people stuck, some upside down. Everybody was just running in to try and help. One year on from the massacre on a Tunisian beach, the holidaymakers who died in Seuss are remembered. And Ireland are out of the Euros after losing to France. Good evening. The political fallout from the vote to leave the European Union engulfed the Labour Party today with a dozen departures from Jeremy Corbyn's top team. It began with the Labour leader's sacking of his shadow Foreign Secretary, Hilary Benn, who told him he had no confidence in his leadership. In the hours that followed, 11 members of the shadow cabinet resigned. In a statement released just in the last few minutes, Mr Corbyn has insisted that he won't step down, saying he would not betray the trust of the many thousands who elected him. Our political editor, Laura Kunzberg, reports. A bad day at the office. A very bad day. It's the Prime Minister who resigned over the referendum result, but arriving home tonight, it's the Labour leader who's lost the support of more than 10 of his most senior colleagues under pressure to do the same. The first departure was of this man, Hilary Benn. He'd clashed with Mr Corbyn before, and was talking to colleagues late last night to find a way of getting the leader out. I said to him that I no longer had confidence Did in... Did you call him first? Uh, uh, I had no longer had confidence in his leadership, and uh, he then dismissed me from the shadow cabinet, which is understandable. The moment everything changed. The British people have spoken, and the answer is, we're out. Voters in traditional Labour areas chose out, not in. Brexit! And there's deep anger among Labour MPs who believe Jeremy Corbyn just didn't pull his weight. Documents I've seen show the leader's office clashed with the main Labour campaign to stay in the EU. I believe we have to vote to remain in order to defend investment, defend jobs, defend workers' rights. He never quite learnt the script. Sources close to him say he had a different message, but not one, not two, not three or four, but 11 other members of his senior team have quit. We need a leader who can help us be a more effective opposition, as well as look like a government in waiting. For all his qualities, I don't believe that leader is Jeremy. Could I say that I felt that Jeremy was the best person to be leading the Labour Party in developing the answers that the country is now demanding? And I didn't feel I could do that. I think the Labour Party more than ever needs to be in government and I'm just not sure that the country, or what people tell me in the country, that can be delivered with Jeremy Corbyn as leader of the Labour Party. I don't think Jeremy uh, is in a position to provide the leadership that we need to be able to offer uh, the voters and offer the country. The party's deputy leader, Tom Watson, had to pack up his sleeping bag and tent and return from the Glastonbury Festival while all that was going on. Saddened by what's happening, he said, seeing Mr Corbyn in the morning. Thank you very much. And Mr Watson matters because he too was elected by the party's members. Hostility towards Mr Corbyn among MPs at Westminster is not new. Many of those who resigned today tried to make it work, but still had deep doubts about his ability. But the Make It Work Brigade has now decided it doesn't work and it can't work. And the only option now is for him to go. 
But his friends and supporters still believe he has the overwhelming support of the party's members far away from here, right around the country. For months, some of Labour's MPs have quite literally been shaking their heads in disbelief at Mr Corbyn's circle. But there's a new awkwardness tonight, even though his close friends still swear they're loyal. I will never stand for the leadership of the Labour Party. If Jeremy has to stand for another leadership election, I will chair his campaign and I think the Labour Party members will elect him again. But I think that's unnecessary. And along with the unions, more of Mr Corbyn's supporters rallied tonight. I believe that he's got the support of the membership. It's likely that Jeremy Corbyn will be continuing as leader of the Labour Party and it's for us as Labour MPs to get behind that leader. Keep Jeremy Corbyn! Keep Jeremy Corbyn! Keep MPs Jeremy will try to Corbyn. vote Mr Corbyn Keep out this Corbyn. week, but the test may be if his supporters in the party, not in Parliament, still turn out in enough numbers to keep him in a job. Laura Kunzberg, BBC News, Westminster. Well, in the wake of David Cameron's resignation, the Conservatives are preparing for a leadership contest with both the Home Secretary, Theresa May, and the Leave campaigner, Boris Johnson, reported tonight to be considering a bid. Whoever takes over will have the immediate challenge of negotiating the terms of a new relationship with the EU. Our political correspondent, Alex Forsyth, reports. We've decided out. Now Westminster's grappling with the consequences of the country's choice. And amid the political turmoil, the key questions being asked, what will the UK look like outside the EU? There'd be tough choices, the Foreign Secretary said, claiming leaving the EU single market, as Leave campaigners suggested, would damage the economy, but staying in means compromising on immigration. The problem is that um, key Leave campaigners made contradictory promises to the British people. We will not be able to negotiate control of migration from the European Union and at the same time full access to the single market. There will have to be a trade-off. And what of other pledges made in this campaign? Will £350 million, the disputed amount it was claimed we sent to Brussels, be spent on the NHS? What we actually said was a significant amount of it will go to the NHS and that is essentially down to the government but I actually believe that is what was pledged and that's what should happen. There was talk about it going to the NHS but there are also the other bits and pieces like agriculture and stuff which is part of that process. So that is the divide up. It was never total but it is a commitment. Not a commitment made by the government though and it's not yet known who will be in charge here when such details are hammered out. On resigning, the Prime Minister said it was for his successor to start the formal process of leaving the EU and lead the negotiations. And that won't happen until October. That leaves a political vacuum. The government didn't want a Brexit, but the country has spoken. So far, though, no one's offering any clarity about the next steps. Those so prominent during this campaign have so far been quiet. No appearance yet from the Chancellor, his first statement expected tomorrow. Others conscious a Tory leadership contest is coming. Mr Johnson, any message of reassurance for the country? Boris Johnson met allies at his home today. It's thought he'll say he'll stand within days. And the Home Secretary too thought to be taking soundings before announcing her bid for number 10. With all this in the background, some leavers are trying to reassure, saying civil servants are talking, but the process can't be rushed. The next Prime Minister will need to engage broadly across both sides of this debate, both within the Conservative Party and beyond. Uh, we have a clear result from the referendum, but we also have many people who voted Remain, and we need to reassure them that uh, the United Kingdom uh, can look forward to huge opportunities outside the European Union. This decision has divided opinion. While some despair, many are delighted. And away from the turbulence here, life goes on. But for now, at least, with more uncertainty. Alex Forsyth, BBC News, Westminster. Well, let's join our political editor, Laura Kunzberg, now live in Westminster. Let's talk about Labour first of all. Laura, where does this series of resignations end? Well, Michelle, we actually expect there to be more resignations from some more junior members of the Shadow Cabinet tomorrow. Look, the referendum result has got both our main political parties in a spin. There's no question about that. But in the last half hour, the Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, has issued a very defiant statement. He said that he regrets that there have been resignations from his top team. But he basically challenges those MPs inside his party who want him out and says if they really want to remove him, well, they're going to have to have a proper leadership contest 
contest and he insists that he will be a candidate in that contest. He reminds them that he has a mandate from the Labour Party membership and his team and those close to him absolutely believe they still have the overwhelming backing of those members away from Westminster, those members who make the final decision in a leadership contest who are right around the country. Now, when you talk to MPs who want him out about this, they say they detect that some of that support is softening, but they know that they would have a very big job on their hands to actually force Mr Corbyn out if they end up in a leadership contest. But he faces a vote of no confidence from MPs this week, and I'm told that there are candidates who are ready to take him on. But the fundamental problem they have is the fact that he was democratically elected by very enthusiastic supporters. He grew the Labour Party membership in those heady days of the campaign last summer. So tonight he is really in a standoff with the parliamentary party here and the Labour Party membership around the country. But the Labour Party seems to be really in chaos as far as its leadership is concerned. A very unhappy time for them with no clear exit strategy at all. Laura, you mentioned the Conservatives being in a spin too, a different kind of spin though. Yes, absolutely. They are not trying to unseat a leader because David Cameron has already said that he's off and he'll be gone by the autumn. And what they are trying to do is find somebody who can be a candidate, not just to lead their party, but someone who would immediately become prime minister once their party's members actually make that decision. We know now that Theresa May, the Home Secretary, is talking to MPs and she's likely to launch her leadership bid in the next couple of days. We know that Boris Johnson is also almost inevitably going to put his hat in the ring this week too. Crucially, with Michael Gove, who had been pressured by some of his colleagues to stand, co-chairing his campaign to become the leader rather than standing himself. And we're told that Boris Johnson will try to pitch himself as a unity candidate. His campaign will be co-chaired by a Northern Ireland minister, Ben Wallace, who was part of the Remain camp. Now, frankly, some people in the Tory party might think it's a bit rich for Boris Johnson, who fought such a bruising campaign for Brexit, to pitch himself as a unity candidate. But that party, too, has a big job on its hands to come together. And David Cameron, the Prime Minister, will be on his feet in the Commons tomorrow, trying to at least begin to explain how the much more complicated long-term process of us leaving the EU will really work. Laura, thank you. Our political editor, Laura Kunzberg, there. Well, I'm going to turn to two more of our uh, editors now. With the markets reopening in the morning, we'll speak to our business editor, Simon Jack, in just a moment. But first, our Europe editor, uh, Katia Adler, who's in Berlin. What are the signs from Berlin, Katia, about uh, how the German government is going to act in terms of the timing of uh, Britain leaving the European Union? Well, Michelle, um, Angela Merkel said this weekend that while the Brexit process shouldn't be indefinite, she would not be pressing for immediate withdrawal. And her chief of staff said today it could take Britain weeks, even months, to give formal notification to the EU that it's leaving. Now, formal notification, of course, sets that clock ticking under the treaties. It then gives the UK two years to untangle itself from everything EU and to work out that new trade relationship. And there had been huge pressure from elsewhere in Europe, particularly from Brussels to give that formal notification as soon as this Tuesday when David Cameron goes to what will be a very awkward summit with other EU leaders. But Germany's voice is hugely influential now more than ever. And Angela Merkel has got a delicate balancing act. On the one hand, she wants to get Britain out as soon as is practically possible while ensuring German trade interests. But on the other, she wants to safeguard the future of the EU. She's invited the French president and the Italian prime minister here to Berlin tomorrow in a show of European unity after the British referendum. The French president from his part said, yes, these big powers, Germany and France, they now need to take the initiative. He wants to push back against creeping Euroscepticism in Europe. He wants to persuade the voters of Europe, particularly the very Eurosceptic French, not to push for their own referendum on EU membership. Katia Adler in Berlin, thank you. Well, tomorrow could be the start of a difficult week on the financial markets uh, after Friday's term while our business editor Simon Jack is here. Uh, how is it looking, Simon? Well, there's an old adage that markets don't like uncertainty, cliche almost, and there is such an abundance of uncertainty and they don't like it one bit. I'm just looking here at the, uh, the markets in Asia have opened. The, the pound is down another 2%. Uh, it got, you know, the market's got this badly wrong. They had factored in a Remain win. 
and a surprise market. It's a very unhappy one. We saw the biggest one day move down in sterling's history. We saw $2.1 trillion wiped off share values across the world. Now, what happened on the, actually the UK off? The UK got off pretty lightly. Uh, it was only down 3% on the stock market, 4% on sterling uh, on Friday. And that's because the Bank of England governor came in and made some reassuring words saying, I've got $250 billion worth of cash, which I can use to all the markets. I expect the Chancellor, who some feel have been missing in action up to now, will say some soothing words and some comforting words tomorrow morning. But given the uncertainty, it's very unlikely that we've seen the end of market turmoil. So it's going to be another busy, sweaty palms, red faces at the city tomorrow morning. Simon, thank you. Scotland's First Minister Nicola Sturgeon said today that she would exhaust every possibility to try and prevent Scotland losing its EU membership. The majority of Scots voted to remain and the First Minister suggested that the Holyrood Parliament could withhold its consent for Brexit. Our Scotland editor Sarah Smith reports. Be very clear about my position. Nicola Sturgeon is here to tell Scottish voters she knows they didn't vote for Brexit and if she can find a way to block the process, she will. She claims the Scottish Parliament could vote against legislation that may be required before the UK leaves the EU. The option of saying that we're not going to vote for something that is against Scotland's interests, e of course that's got to be on the table. Even if that blocked Britain leaving Europe? Don't get me wrong here, Gordon. I, I care about the rest of the UK. I care about England. That's why I'm so upset at the UK-wide decision that's been taken. But I didn't create these situations. Enjoying a Spanish paella in Edinburgh, voters are attempting to digest the EU result and the idea that Scotland could try to block it. I like the sound of that kind of democratic naughtiness from Nicola, so I'm all for it. I just feel it's political opportunism at this time. Um. The vast majority of MSPs do not want to leave the EU, but they're not really sure they have the power to stop it. Well, this is a pretty big claim from the First Minister and she needs to back it up with some strong legal advice. Our understanding and the advice we've received is that this isn't possible. Nicola Sturgeon has promised to do all she can to try to keep Scotland inside the EU. She may attempt to do that by holding a second referendum on Scottish independence. Until then, she can try to use the powers of the Scottish Parliament to frustrate the process of leaving. But can they really block a Brexit? Constitutional experts are not convinced. Holyrood can't block Brexit legislation. There is a principle that if Westminster is going to legislate on devolved matters, it should get the consent of the Scottish Parliament. The Scottish Parliament can refuse that, but Westminster has always been able to override that refusal. Scotland may not have a veto on Brexit, but it does have options. Already, polls are showing a large boost in support for Scottish independence. Sarah Smith, BBC News, Edinburgh. Eight children and two adults have been injured after a roller coaster carriage at a theme park near Glasgow derailed and crashed into a children's ride below. It happened at M&D's theme park in Motherwell. Our correspondent Lorna Gordon reports. The damaged upturned carriages from a roller coaster packed with families. Eyewitnesses said the tsunami ride derailed shortly after it set off before falling 30 feet onto a children's ride close by. I turned around and all I could see was one of the carriages hurtling towards the ground on top of one of the other rides, which was a children's ride, but I've, I'm not sure if anybody was on that ride. But then once it had landed, all I could see was people stuck some upside down. People there said there was silence, followed by screaming. Parents fearful their children were among the injured. Fearing everybody, screaming, kids running back to their mums. As I was going forward to look for my son, they were running to their mums, holding the red disbelief what they'd just seen and just what was witnessed. Onlookers rushed to free those trapped. Within minutes, they were joined by the emergency services with specialist equipment. It was quite clearly uh, distressing. Uh, eight of the, the injured are, are children. Uh, the, the gondola has been, uh, the gondolas have been quite seriously damaged. For whatever reason, uh, part, part or all of them have, have detached from the rails, uh, causing it to, to leave the, the track. Many schools in Scotland have broken up for the summer holidays and there would have been lots of children here at this theme park when the roller coaster derailed. It's not the first time there's been problems with rides here, including with the tsunami roller coaster, but this is the most serious accident to have occurred. 
The park has been closed while an investigation is carried out into what caused the ride to derail. Lorna Gordon, BBC News, Motherwell. British officials say Tunisia is now much safer than a year ago when 38 tourists were shot dead on a beach in the resort of Sousse. A ceremony has been held to remember those killed exactly a year ago, 30 of them Britons. The attack claimed by so-called Islamic State was the greatest loss of British life in a terrorist incident since the July 2005 London bombings. Our correspondent Orla Guerin sent this report from Sousse. The bugler's lament for the dead of Seuss. Then a minute's silence on this foreign shore, where so many Britons were gunned down. Carly Jade Lovett. Adrian Charles Evans. Charles Patrick Evans. And Joel James Richards. This was the moment 12 months ago when a lone gunman brought carnage to the beach. Angela Evans had to play dead as the attacker stood next to her. Back home in King's Lynn, her memories and her grief still raw. Every day I think about the poor people who never came back. And the people who were shot. And I think, what have I got to moan about? I just wish I could reverse everything and work a bit of magic so that those people didn't die. The legacy of the attack is written in the sands. The tourist industry is still struggling to recover. Bookings in Seuss are down by a third. Tunisian officials say the fewer the visitors, the greater the space for terrorists to claim victory. The authorities here are desperate for Britain to change its travel advice and let tourists return. They say security has improved. On the beach today, positive indications from the Foreign Office. I can only say that I've been very, very pleased with the conversations I've had, with the work that our ambassador is doing here, and that the, work, the progress that Tunisians themselves have made. Uh, so I do hope that uh, the review will take place. But one year on, the sorrow remains. And for those who mourn, this beach will always be a byword for bloodshed. Orla Guerin, BBC News, Seuss. Football and Ireland have been knocked out of Euro 2016. They were beaten 2-1 by the host France. It means England will play France if they win their next game against Iceland tomorrow. From Nice, our sports editor Dan Rowan reports. Having already provided one of the tournament's big upsets by beating Italy, the task confronting the Republic of Ireland today was even more daunting, taking on the hosts themselves. Star-studded France are favourites to win Euro 2016, a nation expects, but it certainly wasn't expecting this. In just the second minute, Paul Pogba's clumsy challenge on Shane Long, handing Ireland a penalty. Robbie Brady giving his team the perfect start. Their fans had been granted just 5,000 tickets for this match. Now they were the ones who could be heard. First superbly heading the equaliser, and then immediately after the winner, as Ireland's brave resistance finally gave way. They finished the match with 10 men, having given their all and their opponents a serious scare. Ireland out, but having made an impression they can be proud of. France able to breathe a sigh of relief as they progress to the last eight. And who will play them will be determined here in this stadium in Nice tomorrow evening when England take on Iceland. England seeking their first knockout win at a major tournament for some 10 years with huge amounts at stake for both the team and its manager. This evening the squad had their first look around the Allianz Riviera Stadium as they seek to join Wales in the quarter-finals. Roy Hodgson all too aware this will almost certainly be his last game in charge if the unthinkable happens and England fail. Is most significant for the football team in the country. That's where I see the major significance. We desperately want to stay in the tournament. We think that we're good enough to stay in the tournament, but to do that, we've got to get results, and that must start tomorrow. Standing in England's way, a country with a population of just 330,000. But what? 
Back now to the referendum and parts of the UK that have been receiving European Union funding are seeking assurances that they won't lose out following the Leave vote. Councils in Yorkshire and Cornwall and the Welsh Government have asked for guarantees that EU grants will be matched. Sean Lloyd has been to the South Wales Valleys to gauge reaction. Taking the plunge in the Ponty Lido and voters here took the plunge to leave Europe. Its restoration was partly paid for by three million pounds of European funding designed to help some of the poorest areas. In Pontypridd, like many other former mining communities across South Wales, the majority of people here backed Brexit and there's a feeling around the pool from people on both sides of the divide that politicians now need to get on with it. I think it's going to be good for the country. I think it's about time that somebody took over and um, sort the country out for a bigger and better place. Well, I personally voted to remain. I was a bit disappointed, or very disappointed yesterday, but just got to get on with it now. And if there's funding come from Europe, why can't funding come from central government? But there can be no funding guarantees, according to Plaid Cymru's leader, Leanne Wood, who campaigned for Britain to remain. It's going to mean all of us now being prepared to roll up our sleeves and make sure that this country has a future. It, we have to have an economic future, a cultural and a social future for our children as well. Our children won't have the same opportunities that they would have had had we voted to remain. But that message didn't seem to travel to the Welsh county with the biggest Brexit vote. Blaen Gwent has shared in £4 billion of EU funding allocated to Wales over 16 years. In Ebu Vale, it's helped pay for a new college. They voted in, we voted out. But two-thirds of people living here weren't convinced that Europe should hold the purse strings. European fans have been welcome to the area, but at the end of the day, if we were stayed out of Europe, those funds should be allocated to Wales anyway. I voted to remain in Europe, I did, because like I said, I think if it's not broke, why, you know, why change it? We have funding from Europe here, haven't uh, you? Hang on, no. no. It's only the money we put in. There seems no disagreement that communities like these need help. Those who campaign for Britain to leave Europe say it will come from closer to home. Now that the country has voted so decisively to take back control of its sovereignty, it'll be for politicians here in Wales and at Westminster to determine the new course of action that's required to make sure economic activity returns to many of these disadvantaged communities. According to some, Europe through communities like this one, a lifeline. Change is in the air and what people living here want to know now is that help will still be at hand. Sean Lloyd, BBC News in the South Wales Valleys. A first look at the papers is next on the BBC News Channel. Here on BBC One, it's time for the news wherever you are. Good night.